everybody. We're going to improvise slightly for this. We're going to roll in the Q and A, the conversation and the ceremony all into one. First of all, though, I do think we should have a massive round of applause for <laughs> Professor Dave <laughs> Leslie Regan. <laughs> now, we knew when we elected Dame Leslie to this honorary fellowship that she was obstinate and didn't give up <laughs> easily. And those were qualities that I think we've seen in firm evidence this evening. So <laughs> it, we've made an excellent choice. Thank you for not turning around and for defeating the train strike. <laughs> so I'm going to say a few words about who you are and what you've done. And then we'll have a little bit of I think straight away Q&A, because I think people will have questions they'd love to ask you. So firstly, by way of introduction, Dame Leslie graduated from the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine in London in 1980, and then pursued a career at somewhere we all know, Addenbrooke's, <laughs> where she first became enthused by clinical and lab research and you completed an MD on miscarriage. Dame Leslie has been Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at Imperial College London and an honorary consultant at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust since 1990. And she was a bi-fellow and joint director of studies in medicine at Girton College from 1985 to 1990. So you had a full five years here. We were just walking down the corridor and uh, Dame Leslie was marvelling at the change of the portraits and the additions. <laughs> and she was honorary secretary, or she is honorary secretary for the International Federation of Gynaecology and Obstetrics since 2018. Gosh, there's such a long list here. <laughs> Chair of the Wellbeing of Women since October 2020 and also Chair of Charity for Research into Miscarriage. In 2020, in the New Year's Honours Lists, she was awarded a DBE, Damehood for Services to Women's Health. She was the former president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and only the second woman ever to hold that role. And just think about what that role is, <laughs> gynaecology and obstetrics. Yeah. So that's pretty uh, astonishing and the first woman in 64 years to hold that role. I remember reading in an article, uh, interview actually, interview article with you in the Times recently that you said at the beginning of your year, that uh, at the beginning of your career, that you, heard, you overheard surgeons speaking over your head saying, oh, she'll never make it because she's a woman. So I think this is a, a really happy tale of the wheel of fortune turning and you, you know, can't keep a great person down. She has now been appointed as the first Women's Health Ambassador for England. That's in 2022. And so you are now busy resetting the balance in the NHS. I'm going to add a few other quick snippets of information. I can tell you that Dame Leslie's favourite singers are Nina Simone, <laughs> Katie Mellower, and with a special appreciation of Tina Turner. I know that from Desert Island Discs. <laughs> that she's a huge fan of Marmite on Toast. Finally something we share in our CVs. And in terms of films, which do you think, Barbie or Oppenheimer? <laughs> Hands up, Oppenheimer. Oh, it's, oh, it's Oppenheimer. <laughs> and then finally, favourite book to take to a desert island. This is so fitting for Girton, the works of George Eliot. Yeah. So I think I'm going to ask you one question, hand over to the floor, and then close it in about five minutes. I just want to know, what is it that has driven you and continues to drive you, if you had to think of 
just one thing. What is it that power, powers you? The belief that if you can give, if you give women um, the information they need to help themselves, particularly in their health, which I'm, I think I'm quite well um, qualified to talk about, that not only do they usually do it, but they tell everybody else in their life about it too. So they are the most extraordinary <laughs> ambassadors. And um, I just think that we constantly miss a trick in our health service because we don't empower them to know what they need to do to help themselves and help their families. So when I was president at the RCAG, I published a, um, a report, which I was very proud of. It was called Better for Women. Um, and the, it ended on the, on the, the if we see, if we get it better for women, we get it better for everyone in society. And we can also get it better for less money because we waste enormous amounts of health service and all sorts of other government department money on getting women to move around the services that they need to maintain their health. So the vast majority of occasions when women go and see a healthcare professional, they're not sick. You're not sick when you go to get your contraception sorted out or your cervical smear. Um, you're not sick really when you're pregnant either. Um, so we should be ensuring that they can access things. That's a rather long answer to your question, but that's what, get, that's what gets me up in the morning. And I'm just very, very excited at the moment because for the last couple of months, we've had a female Secretary of State, the first for decades and decades, who came to a summit that I'd organized a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago to be exact, two weeks. And she stood up and said, I'm so thrilled to be here. Women's health is one of my top priorities. And then she turned around and she said, I'm sorry, gentlemen, she said, but I see this as a feminist Christmas. I mean, how fabulous was that? <laughs> so I think we're, we're on a cusp now. I was getting a bit, I was getting a bit um, frustrated and, and disillusioned by the end of last year, but she's really, um, she's really fired me up with the fact we can do it. We, we, can, we can have can do rather than, oh, no, you can't do that, which is often what you get in the civil service mm -hmm. and in the NHS. <laughs> I noticed in your Times interview that you did say definitely a glass half full person. Yes. And I thought, well, we can, we can hear that now. So just before I hand over to one or two questions from the floor, if you had to advise your 18 to 22 year old self, what is your top piece of advice you would give yourself if you could do that all again? We haven't warned Le Dame Leslie about any of these questions, so really putting you on the spot. Well, there would be several, but um, at that age, I think that what I should have heard, known about, um, or perhaps I did know about in a funny sort of way, was that opportunities in life very rarely make appointments. And if you don't grab them when they flash past you, then you miss them. And I think it would be the only thing that I would truly have regretted in life if I hadn't grabbed the opportunities, even when it was at totally the wrong time or with totally the wrong people. Um, but I, I do think that's important. They don't make appointments and you, and you have to make sometimes a snap, snap judgment. I need to try that or I need to understand about that and do it. So be courageous. Be courageous. And wise. Wow. Does anyone have anything that they've been dying to ask Dame Leslie before we launch into the ceremony? We've got quite a few students here, I know. I'm so sorry, students, that I let you down earlier. <laughs> oh, we're going to have you back. <laughs> We've got a great excuse now. Yes. Um, so I'm writing my dissertation on maternal mortality in the U.S. based on what state someone lives in um, and their like Medicaid status. And I'm interested in what are the key steps you think we need to take to empower women to advocate for their own health? Because a lot of t cases, like, Women say that something's wrong, but their doctor's telling them that something isn't wrong. So, like, how can we empower women to advocate for themselves in their own health care? Well, I think we need to, as I say, inform them and provide them with the information. Um, I believe that whatever educational level a girl or a woman is at, you can always find a way, if you care, um, to convey what they need to know. So. I mean, I can't go into everything that's wrong in the US. So you and I could have a chat about that a little later. But there's an awful lot wrong with it. And it's not just about Medicaid and um, there not being an NHS. It's also a, a very patriarchal society. 
Um, they disapprove of contraception, let alone abortion, um, which are two absolutely core of issues in women's health. And you can have very polarised views about the rights and wrongs of them, but if you live in a society where you don't have contraception and safe abortion, then the problem doesn't go away, it goes underground, and girls and women die. And any of you who've had any experience overseas, you will know that. Uh, I've seen women dying in front of me in sub-Saharan Africa in Southeast Asia. So we must have that. And we have to explain, I think, the answer to your the real question, is that we have to make sure that girls and women um, understand what uh, a menstrual, a period problem is. Because I don't think there's anything happens to human beings quite as frequently as menstrual periods. So most of the women in this room will have had, I'm past tense now, happily menopausal, but I, all, of, all, all women are going to have 12 periods a year for 40 years of their lives. So if their period makes them, uh, gives them pain or means that they can't go out because they're frightened of flooding or whatever, that is not normal. And yet I think so often you'll find that clinicians will say to women, oh, well, it's your period, you know, just get on with it. So I think that's a really important thing. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do as the ambassador to embed these women's health hubs. But I want, if there are any other doctors in the room, there are one or two. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, whatever your specialty is, even if you're an orthopedic surgeon, if you're if you're, you've got 51% of the population in front of you are female, and when that woman comes to consult you about your shoulder or your head or your, or your, your eye or whatever, you need to ask them about their periods in the same way that um, if you came to see me in my clinic, I'd ask you about how many operations you've had and what drugs you're taking. And if I didn't, you'd think I was being a bit sloppy, wouldn't you? But, you know, as I say, they have 12 of these periods a year for 40 years of their lives, and uh, they are frequently disabled by them. And if we look at that globally, it's even more important. You know, one third of the women in the world have got iron deficiency anemia from menstrual problems. Mm. One third. There's strong economic arguments too. There are very strong economic arguments. Sadly, the reason why the government got behind the menopause program was because they were, they were convinced, or the Treasury became convinced, that actually women leaving work between 45 and 65 was really bad economically. I've now got to ensure that the, the next thing that the Treasury gets behind is that it is ridiculous for girls and women to not go to school or can't finish their, they can't go to college um, or they can't go to work or they can't complete their caring uh, roles because women do about 70% of all the unpaid caring in the country. Uh, if they can't do that because of their period problems, then that is a terrible economic burden. We've got to do the accounting differently, I think. Well, this is so amazing that I think we could, uh, we could kidnap you and keep you here for a week. But what we will do is get on with our ceremony and hope that we might invite you back. Of course, I'd be delighted to come. I'd be delighted to come. I'm, I, I, g g nothing gives me more pleasure than talking about how we can improve women's health. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we would absolutely love to take you up on that, and we will. Thank you very much indeed. Sure. Sure.